Welcome to the Osimo Early Bird Podcast. It's your old pal Emac coming to you on a new platform with one Adam Ship My Money Share. The Dream Team is back, Adam. How have you been doing? It's been forever since we've had a chance to talk in person. <laughs> yeah, doing pretty well. Excited to, I think we have, a, we have several podcasts together this week um, and I assume moving forward. So pretty excited for that and really excited to get started on a new NBA season. All right. We are just going to jump right in here. Our podcast will be ramping up now that we have basketball every day. The season tips off. You'll be listening to this on Tuesday morning. We have a two-game slate, and then everything really starts in earnest on Wednesday with, uh, I believe it's a 10 or an 11 gamer. So that one should be exciting. Let's uh, break down the upcoming schedule. You will get Adam and me on, let me think here, today's Monday. So we're going to do it Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and then you'll get Adam and I for a Saturday show. I think it's how we're going to work this out. You'll get Lafayette and Stratford the other days. The true dream team were just posers, Adam. They were the original dream team of DFS podcasting. But let's jump in. We've got our two gamers on uh, the the big contests are up on Fantasy Draft. It is a $10,000 contest. It is a $25 buy-in. On Yahoo, it is a $10,000 contest with a $5 buy-in. Remember, they have late swap, Fantasy Draft does not. We'll talk more about late swap in a second, but they also have a 10 entry limit. So if you are not wanting to go against the mass multi-entry people, that site would be for you. On FanDuel, they have a $1 million contest and 250,000 will be going to first. Slightly top heavy. Same thing over on DraftKings. What's new on FanDuel? Well, I'm glad you asked. They did not bring in a late swap. Instead, to combat that, they will now keep their same rosters, their same scoring. It looks like their same salary, but they will be dropping your lowest scoring player each night. So if you have someone that is scratched, then you don't have to worry about it. If you have two people that are scratched, well, you have larger problems. But if you just, uh, no matter what, so if somebody has the flu, if somebody has a horrible shooting night, you know, you pick like a 37-year-old shooting guard who's cheap like, oh, I don't know, Mr. Jamal Crawford. Anyone <laughs> who's signing with Phoenix, but uh, we have that. And then on DraftKings, they brought back late swap. Last year was the first year they did not have it. You know what, Adam? At first, I didn't like late swap, or I liked having it. But then I learned that I was using it incorrectly, that I only used it to get rid of players that were hurt or who got scratched. Apparently, there's a whole new strategy on how to re-optimize your lineups with each little bit of breaking news. What is your approach going to be this year? Are you pro late swap and DraftKings or are you anti late swap and you're going to be looking at FanDuel? Yeah, I've always been very pro late swap. And I think that the whole you're at a competitive disadvantage because other people use late swap better than you think. It's true, but if you're, especially if you're a tournament player, I think it's kind of overstated. If you're playing cash games and you're not using late swap for you know other than to make sure that you don't take a zero you're probably gonna get beat pretty bad because you should be using it to you know give yourself outs in head to heads you should be using it obviously to optimize your lineups but in tournaments if you're someone that you know plays 10 to 20 tournament lineups and you're more of the casual player that theoretically would be hurt by you know pros or whatever you want to call them using late swap optimally you're it, it's still just such a rare occurrence that you're a going to be at the top of a leaderboard B you're going to have someone right behind you that is using late swap correctly. And then C there is actual late breaking news that that person's able to use in their lineup. Like it, you're just at the top of a leaderboard so infrequently that it's kind of a really rare um, circum set of circumstances that it's actually going to hurt you. If you're the kind of guy that, you know, just gets home from work, throws 10 lineups in a tournament and is just hoping to take one down. Like you probably know that you're not playing optimally. Anyway, you're not looking to use DFS to consistently make a bunch of money, but if you can win 30 K in a night, that's great. And I think that having late swap for the people like that is, it should be appealing because it does keep you from taking that zero and more times than not, 
it's not going to hurt you not using it correctly. If you're a mass multi-entry guy, then you get back to different ways that you can use it. And I actually cost myself some money in preseason recently just because I'm not used to, to max entering with it because it had been a while. And, you know, I had a bunch of really good tournaments going into the last game of the night. And instead of going through and decreasing my exposure to certain guys and giving myself as many different combinations of the remaining players as I could in my very similarly constructed lineups, I didn't do that. And then I'm sitting there at the end of the night looking at, you know, how many times I have myself blocked. And so that's something that if you're max entering, you'll want to pay attention to. But I think for the casual person who is playing a limited number of entries and just trying to hit one or two GPPs a year and, you know, pay off their car or whatever, I don't think it's as bad for them as a lot of people make it out to be. Yes. And for me, I've, I've learned that I kind of want my night to sort of be over once lock hits. So I I think depending now I don't do the mass multi-entry for basketball yet. I've been dabbling with football and with baseball. So if I try it, I'm not, I'm not sure how I want to do it because it's just, I found it to be a little daunting. So for basketball, I generally only make somewhere between three and and 10 hand built lineups. So I kind of like to play on Yahoo because they had late swap last year and it was sort of manageable and it wasn't like people were doing a lot of crazy stuff in the tournaments. I also like draft the draft app because you could, if your guy was scratched, you could just put in another player of those remaining in the pool. So I like that because not everybody could be moving and switching and doing stuff and there's less overlap. For me, the basketball overlap is just so insanely high that I don't find it as enjoyable. I really like watching basketball. I like analyzing it. I like reading about it. I like watching our shows, but when it comes down to it, it's just the herd is so strong these days. Now there are counter moves to that as well, um, which is the good thing. And, And each day we'll have something that is called the NBA strategy show and that will be on awesomeo.com you'll get uh josh engelman alternating with adam and of course Alafi d and those are kind of fun shows i enjoyed those for for basket or baseball i'm curious to see how how we work with those out for basketball so that should be a good time uh ahead again that is on our youtube channel over there at awesomeo.com Calm. All right, let's talk about the change at FanDuel, and then we'll get into the games here. FanDuel, as we mentioned, you will uh, they will drop your lowest score. Everything else remains the same, but your lowest scoring player is out. It's locks at, at uh, the start of the first game, and then you let it ride. How do you th- – I know you've done a little uh, analysis on this. I have seen the people talking about it on Twitter. Similarly, a site several years ago about in the 2015 range uh, called Victive had something similar. Uh, they had a reserve player. There were certain rules that you couldn't – like their minimum player was 4000 but you couldn't spend more than like 5000 on this guy. The, the average expensive player was like 8000 They had pretty flexible rosters. But it was an interesting concept that no one had done before. And that kind of feels like what we're doing here, similar to fantasy draft, dropping your two lowest golfers, uh, et cetera. So I think it's it's interesting, but what is going to be the ideal strategy for this? You just don't want to take it zero, I'm guessing, but you're going to want to go cheap with someone who's viable. Have you mentally done the exercises on how you want to approach things until we start to see some data points? Yeah, I'm really interested to see how this works out because the first thing I – thought of was that you should be willing to just take a zero or whatever at whatever the weakest position is. Normally that's going to be small forward since you have to roster two or shooting guard. But I would think that on most nights, if you go in with the strategy of just put in uh, putting in a minimum priced guy who, you know, maybe he's a defensive guy, you know, like an Andre Roberson type guy who's going to play 30 plus minutes. And a few times a year, he racks up a ton of steals, tons of blocks and puts up 30 plus uh, fantasy points. But more often than not, he's he's not really going to do anything for you. But putting in a guy like that gets your average salary from around 6,500 up to $7,000 for the rest of your lineup. So you should be able to get you know, an extra really good player into your lineup. But where I think it's going to get interesting is I assume people will make mistakes with it at the beginning of the season, just because it's new and people are going to mess it up. But then as the season goes on, I'm really interested to see what happens because I think you'll get to where it basically becomes quote unquote optimal to do what I just said. And it's what people just kind of mindlessly do when they build their lineups. But FanDuel also is awful at pricing players. And so as the season goes on, 
and there are more injuries and there are more value guys, you're going to see, I think, a lot of slates where you can just throw everything I just set out the window because there's going to be so many cheap, good value plays that you don't want to waste a spot on you know, an Andre Roberson. You want to just build your lineups just like you would have before and with, with the knowledge that you're going to get your lowest score dropped. So it will always benefit stars and scrubs. But I think that how tightly FanDuel prices their guys will – factor into what the actual optimal strategy is as far as, you know, do you just completely punt in a position expecting nothing from someone or are you just making stars and scrubs lineups like you would have last year? Yeah. I think the, the first way they could combat it well is to have a little more realistic pricing. The second way would be to increase the floor or the minimum of whatever the summer is. I, yeah. I think off the top of my head, it's 3,500. Uh, if I'm remembering yeah, 3,500. Yeah, so if they bump that up to 4,000 or 4,500, makes it a little bit more challenging. Maybe you're not going incredibly uh, stars and scrubs, and maybe maybe a little bit more balanced tends to work itself out. Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But again, make sure you look at uh, some of the contests, see what some of the, the smarter names, the, the names you're used to seeing. Go look at the, the large field 50-50s and see what uh, the people are doing for the first week or so and perhaps they'll have a, a different take on things and you'll just see stuff play out because it will re- really vary from slate to slate. And as you mentioned, once we get into February, just past the all-star break, we come into NBA flu season and then we have the tanking really start in earnest and people getting rested, et cetera. It's going to make it like a pick them unless they do yeah. something. And I, I think that uh, roster construction wise, I think it was awesome. O had mentioned it. It's not going to change a lot as far as stars and scrubs. Everyone basically goes stars and scrubs anyway. It's just going to be slate to slate figuring out where, and I mean, and it's like that anyway, you want to figure out where to pay down, but it's going to be, I think kind of an extra step of analysis as far as, you know, do I want to just completely punt a, a bad position? Do I, you know, want, is there enough value that I can just make normal lineups? I think that's where the, the strategy from slate to slate will come in. All right, uh, one last little bit of housekeeping. Don't forget, we do have a bunch of stuff behind the paywall. We've got the full on suite of projections from one hot magic. That would be Andrew Barron. He's got the football, basketball, baseball, and PGA projections there. We have Jay Kari, who does the NHL projections. And, of course, you get Osmo's personal rankings himself. So that is the good stuff behind the paywall. There's also going to be a main article, I think. We'll see. Oh, there is going to be one. It's the deep dive. I believe we might go through a little bit of a rebranding for that. But those of you who remember, that is uh, Adam and Lafayette writing their multi-thousand word opus each day about their love for various players at all of the pricing tiers on the sites. Are you ready, Adam? To see? You can at least ease into this one with the two-gamer. But are you ready for those big slates? Yeah, having the Tuesday, Thursday during uh, NBA, it used to be nice because they didn't have the balanced scheduling and I was getting like two and four game slates all the time. But now that they go balanced more, I I don't get off quite as easy as I used to. Yes, so we'll see what happens. We got a uh, uh, Saturday's got a pretty big slate, so we'll be doing it for that. But let's jump into the Tuesday slate. As we mentioned, there are just two games, but hey, we've got some decisions here. First game is going to go off at 8 o'clock Eastern. It is the Philadelphia 76ers going into Boston to take on division rival Celtics. We have a 209 over under with a 102 and a hook going to Philadelphia and 106 and a hook going to Boston. News and notes. Let's see who changed. Well, for Philadelphia, they no longer have Ursan Ilyasova or Marco Bellinelli. They do have Wilson Chandler, who's out with a hamstring. Guaranteed he is out. And they have Mike Muscala, who's highly questionable with an ankle injury. Those are the two new guys. Um, We've got a little Markel Fultz in our lives who will be starting the first half. J.J. Redick, it sounds like. We'll be starting the second half at shooting guard, so we'll have to see how that plays out. We do know that uh, Jared Bayless is going to miss the first three or four weeks. He's got a knee issue. Um, We have uh, Saric and uh, Simmons. Both were a little dinged up, missed their last practice. They're probable with a back and a neck injury, uh, respectively. Normal things, just they were giving them a day off and had to put in a reason. So we've got those guys. We've got TJ McConnell, who should be having a bit of a prominent role here with uh, Muscala and Chandler out. We know that Amir Johnson will be coming off the bench as well. 
and then when we're bringing up these these uh, lesser players, shall we say? Well, good God, they're the top 0.1 percent of 0.1 percent basketball players. But uh, because there's only a two game slate, we're going to have to look at a lot of different things. So they also have uh, Landry uh, Shamet from Wichita State is one of their guys who should see some minutes. What do you got here for the Philadelphia 76ers? Not a whole lot that I'm too excited about in this game in general, but especially from the Sixers. I mean, Joel Embiid obviously is a or the top center play. He's absolutely phenomenal. He does well in this matchup. Last year, um, posted double doubles in all three meetings with with Al Horford and the Celtics. Uh, really big game in his most recent game in, in January. Uh, went for 26, 16, and six. So if you can fit Embiid into your lineup, obviously, you know he's, he's a really strong play. Ben Simmons as well, but you do run a little bit more risk with Simmons just because it is not going to be as fast paced a game as the Warriors Thunder game should be. It is a really good Boston defense that he's going up against. Obviously a really good player, but you have him at the same position, you know, as, as Steph Curry. So it gets kind of tough there, but, and the one that really stands out to me as far as the secondary plays, you know, I think faults obviously has upside. It, it is a tough matchup for him, but he played relatively well in the preseason. I think that you can look there. Robert Covington is cheap on DraftKings for the minutes that he plays. He, it's not a good spot. He's someone that very easily can disappoint, but at 4,700, he lets you get some of the stars that you want into your lineup. So I think that he's going to at least play valuable minutes. Yeah, and the one guy I like also as well is Saric. So that's uh, we've now named the starters there uh, with that, but that'll be Simmons, Fultz, Covington, Saric, and Embiid. On the other side, we have the Boston Celtics. They do not have Greg Monroe, but they do have new additions. Gordon Hayward, who played, what, 90 seconds last yeah. year? <laughs> He's back. Kyrie Irving is uh, healthy again. Uh, he missed, of course, their playoff run. So that's going to dramatically change a lot of what is going on with Boston because we're kind of used to saying, oh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Brown and Tatum were great and Terry Rozier and Marcus Morris uh, and, and Marcus Smart had their moments and, and Aaron Baines was, was usable. We got two full-time guys coming back in that we hadn't seen one for the entire year and one for the last, you know, month and a half. What are you uh, What are you looking at here from Boston? There, the only injury news that I, I was able to find is that Hayward, as he's rounding into form, will probably play in the twenty-five to thirty-minute range for the first two weeks of the season. Now that's a coach guessing. If he played twenty, it wouldn't shock me. If he played thirty or whatever, that wouldn't shock me either. So I just think we need to to realize he's going to be capped a little bit, and he was also a little rusty in the preseason. Yeah, I think actually the biggest takeaway for me early on, at least with with this two-game slate, is that if Gordon Hayward is limited to 25 to 30 minutes, it kind of helps lock in Marcus Morris in the low 20s, I think, you know, at, at the least. And he's only 4,300 on DraftKings. He, he averaged 0.9 fantasy points per minute last season. If you can get t- around 20 fantasy points out of Morris on this slate at 4,300, that opens up a ton for you. So Hayward being somewhat limited in his minutes, I think just helps to solidify Marcus Morris as a really good value option at 4,300. Uh, Hayward himself, not really someone that I'm, you know, looking to go to outside of the fact that it's a two-game slate, but, you know, just talking about top point per hour play is not someone that I'm overly interested in on the minutes limit, you know, in a, just a a less appealing game, I think than the late game, I think Kyrie is fine. Obviously he's someone that can go out there and dominate, but again, just not as fast paced a game as the, the latter game. So more of a secondary option for me as well. Yeah. The, the path to goodness, I think for Hayward is, is if he comes out and knocks down all his three pointers, if he gets four or five in his minutes, all of a sudden you're looking at him flirting with 20 points, that's going to get him over the hump. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, Oh, that was one thing I wanted to ask. Have you seen the dramatic shift in three pointers uh, that from the preseason to even compared to last year, uh, there was somebody was tweeting them uh, out in the Houston was trying 50 or 51 three-pointers a game in the preseason. The Wizards are trying in the, the mid-30s. They averaged like low 20s last year. It's a, it's a whole new league. We thought football was crazy with, with the new defensive rules. Oh, good God. Even our slow teams are embracing this uh, pace and space. And not only that, but it's something to pay attention to early in the season because it's something that will not show up in the models that people use is there are a lot of bigs now that have 
uh, spent the entire summer trying to make this part of their game. And so people, at least until they adjust, you're going to have for a lot of people, I think you're going to have their models basically telling them that, you know, so-and-so player is the type of player he's been in the past, whereas now he's stepping out and shooting three pointers. You're seeing Jan Mahinmi do it. We saw Dwayne Dedman doing it last season. Mark Gasol and Pal Gasol, both are guys that we've seen, you know, in recent years step out beyond the three point line. And now it's just becoming even more popular for big Andre to- Drummond's out there. Yeah. He can't yeah. hit yeah. free throws, yet he's gonna launch it from downtown. Yeah, and they were they were talking I think it was Rod Beard, their their beat reporter on Twitter was saying that they were they've talked about Drummond, you know, averaging like three and a half threes per game possibly. That's just wild. That's just wild. So file that away. Uh, In the meantime, rounding out the starting lineup for the Celtics, in addition to Hayward, we've got Kyrie Irving. We've got Mr. Brown, Mr. Tatum, and Mr. Horford. Uh, Plays coming off the bench, you did mention Marcus Morris. We know that Marcus Smart will get some time. The the guy I don't know what's going to happen with is going to be Terry Rozier. Yeah, he's kind of the direct backup for Irving, but we're used to seeing Rozier do a ton, and he doesn't have the best – I don't think usage is the proper term, but it takes him a lot of minutes to get his stats, Adam. So I'm a little nervous because he's not going to be getting the minutes this year. Now, he's reasonably priced as a super cheapie for that new role, but I just think we might mentally uh, value him a little too much at this juncture. Yeah, I mean, with Irving back and with Smart back and with Jalen Brown healthy, it's just tough to really see a path. And obviously with Hayward back, it's just tough to to see you know a path there. I do think the one bench guy outside of Morris, one bench guy from Boston that is interesting if you're playing a bunch of tournament lineups is Aaron Baines because he's just this big who Boston, we saw them last year at times, they would use him in the tougher defensive matchups against talented uh, you know bigs on the other team. Obviously, Embiid fits that mold. So... Um, it's obviously a it's a risky play because we don't know where the minutes will be, but there's certainly a path to Aaron Baines playing more minutes than normal in this in this matchup. All right, let's move on to the nightcap. Our one game at ten thirty. It is the Oklahoma City Thunder going into Golden State there in San Francisco to take on the Warriors. Two twenty four over under. We have the Warriors are favored by twelve. So that means a 106 implied total for the Thunder, 118 for the Warriors. We do have some uh, injury uh, notes here. Russell Westbrook, we're not sure what's going to happen. He had um, knee surgery in the offseason and has not played yet. He has not been cleared, but he has not been officially ruled out. My guess is he's not going to play. Uh, They had uh, Terrence Ferguson was in the concussion protocol. He has cleared that and has practiced, so he should be good to go. Uh, Patrick Patterson, of all people, I didn't even realize he played for them last year. By the way, Patrick Patterson, this is like his eighth year in the league. I remember him from Toronto. I don't know how I forgot the Houston days because that's who he was drafted by. And I'm like, oh, good God, I remember him with Houston. He was productive. He's just kind of disappeared. But uh, I think he's going to be in the starting lineup. But we know that uh, Jeremy Grant's going to have a big role. Uh, We know that Sam uh, that uh, Stephen Adams will. Sorry, I bought some Samuel Adams beer this weekend, <laughs> so <laughs> slipped there. But uh, if Westbrook is out, that means newcomer Dennis Schroeder is going to ha- have a lot of minutes. That uh, other newcomer is Nerlens Noel, and they don't have Carmelo Anthony, which is addition by subtraction uh, for their particular style of play. So let's first off, do you think it's even one in three that Westbrook plays on Tuesday? I don't think so. It just sounds like he's been really limited at practice. And if he were going to play, I kind of assume that that would have come out by now. Um, so I'm, I'm approaching it as if he's not going to play. I assume that we'll have that news early enough tomorrow. But, uh, yeah, for now, I'm assuming he doesn't play. All right. So let's analyze it as if he does not play. So I think that definitely puts Schroeder and George into, uh, I don't know, I hate the word must play, but good God, they're going to have so much usage in the highest pace game, and they're both reasonably priced. I don't see how you make lineups without them. Yeah, I mean, looking at last year, um, Paul George without Westbrook on the floor had a 36.9% usage percentage, averaged one and a quarter DraftKings points per minute, and that's not accounting for Carmelo Anthony, but I kind of figure that Schroeder will fill that that void in usage. So that's fine. Um, Anthony in his time alongside Paul George had a 35% usage percentage. We know Dennis Schroeder is not afraid to take up his share of possessions. So I think that kind of just 
replicating Anthony's role in the offense as far as usage goes makes some sense here for for Schroeder. So yeah, I think if Westbrook sits, both of those guys are obviously going to be focal points of the Oklahoma City offense. You'll also have more solidified minutes for Raymond Felton, who had a 24.5% usage rate without Westbrook on the floor last year. Um, If you account for Paul George being on the floor, he still had a 20.5% usage rate. He's cheap enough that I think he'll end up being a top value player. All right. Uh, I am not really a fan of Patrick Patterson as the starter. I would much prefer to get Jeremy Grant coming off the bench. I do think Nerlens Noel is intriguing, having spent uh, his time in purgatory for his lost season there in Dallas. Uh, those guys are kind of interesting to me. The total – I'm curious for your take on that. The total scrub it up is I'm just kind of riding off our uh, Felton. Uh, he, he's nearly min price, but he's going to play probably 14 minutes. And, Felton? Yeah, Raymond Felton. Well, uh, Yeah, I think he plays more than 14 minutes. Okay, then let's talk about him. Will he will he make more than three shots? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I, a, that's a fair question. <laughs> if Westbrook sits, I, I think Felton's one of the best value plays. Like, who's gonna play the guard positions? Um, he like he kind of has to play minutes. He was productive last season on a per minute basis when he shared the floor with Paul George. He averaged three quarters of a fantasy point per minute. But if Westbrook's out, it also gives Felton more time without George because. Last season, George, a lot of the time, played with the second unit, and that took the ball out of Raymond Felton's hands. If Westbrook isn't in the lineup, you're less likely to see George leaving the game, leaving early and having his minutes staggered and coming in with the second unit, which would put the ball in Raymond Felton's hands more when he is on the floor, potentially. So um, I do think that if Westbrook sits, Felton's a a really strong value play. Um, And I do agree with you on Jeremy Grant being a good play, you know, whether he starts, whether he comes off the bench. It's just the kind of game where they – he, he fits well, I think. Yeah, and there are certain situations where you don't want any part of him either because yes. he's a decent player, but he's, he's the consummate garbage man. He does a little bit of everything. There's no real plays designed for him. So if it's the wrong, the wrong game flow, he does not do well. And see, this is good. This is why we got to talk things through. I, I did not play that one all the way through. So here is the follow-up question for Felton. Would you use him at 3600 on FanDuel as your lower priced guy? Would you be willing to punt on one of the point guard positions, which is one of the most productive positions? Yeah, I was actually playing around with it earlier, and I talked to Josh on Twitter about it over the last couple of days. And originally I was thinking that I wouldn't really want to do that, but I think it's – actually reasonable on the the issue is that I think a lot of people will do it and playing a really popular Raymond Felton is never all that fun but but it gets you Embiid it well right exactly and and the big thing for me is that on FanDuel Dennis Schroeder is a shooting guard so oh nice if if you I I wouldn't want to sacrifice one of Curry or Schroeder for Raymond Felton but you don't have to and he lets you get them both in and there's really no other great point guard I don't think I mean Kyrie Irving obviously is good Ben Simmons is good but they're both expensive too the guys that I would want to prioritize from that position are Curry and Schroeder and you can play Schroeder at shooting guard so yeah I I think and and then at small forward you have Durant and you have Paul George on the slate so yeah I think that Felton at 3600 I believe it is a point guard makes makes more sense than I kind of assumed it would going in all right, uh, Golden State, let's, uh, let's talk about them because then I'm going to circle back and ask you what you think of the front court for the Thunder. So Golden State's the change they have. They got rid of their front court, uh, not, uh, those not named Draymond Green, but no more JaVale McGee, no more Zaza Pachulia, and no more Swaggy P. Of course, he's the shooting guard. They do have DeMarcus Cousins, but he's not going to be ready until sometime probably in January. And at that point, it's going to be like they just got a great trade chip. So – bully for them um but Draymond Green has been dealing with a sore knee and uh, coach Kerr has said he will probably play 18 to 22 minutes for the first uh week or two just to see how his knee's going to respond and they have a long season ahead of them and of course they have designs on uh defending their title so I, I want uh, I don't want any part of him but it looks like Damian Jones uh, will most likely draw the start is what people are projecting. And then uh, Jordan Bell should see a ton of minutes without Draymond Green there. Now, Bell on most of the sites is like a center. I always thought he was a power forward. Of course, these are early positional uh, things. What do you think about Jones or Bell and their def- 
I, I mean, their defense is okay, but I got to like Steven Adams. Yeah, Damian Jones was pretty impressive in the preseason from a fantasy standpoint. Did a really good job of just producing when he was on the floor. He looked like a good fit. So I like him quite a bit here. You know, if Green is going to be limited to 18 to 22 minutes, it helps to solidify Damian Jones minutes even more. The issue would be that it is a tough matchup with Steven Adams. But I mean, it's two games late, value's limited, and he's really, really cheap. So uh, yeah, and then Jordan Bell, you know, basically just becomes a guy kind of similar to Jeremy Grant, I guess, but just a guy where it's a two-game slate and he is capable of producing at a high fantasy point per minute clip if he gets the, the playing time. So he's certainly someone that if you're playing a lot of lineups, you want to have in your pool just because he's the kind of guy that if something weird happens and he gets 20-plus minutes, you have to have him probably to win a tournament. Um, that's not the case for you know a lot of players who are capable of playing 20 minutes and scoring five points, but Bell generally produces when he's out there. So does Jeremy Grant. Uh, Damian Jones looks like someone that will do the same. So, yeah, I think that if you're running a lot of lineups, maybe even setting a rule in Cruncher or something to have you know at least one of like Jones, Bell, Grant, or something like that is probably a good way to go because it's pretty likely that one of them gets extended run and produces well. All right. Now, uh, with with them, we, we know the cast of characters. Good God, it's the All Star team, of course. Curry, Clay Thompson, Durant. Uh, th- those guys don't need a ton of analysis on them. I would probably not be a huge fan of Clay. I generally like to look at guys that uh, do a variety of things. I don't play a ton of him, unless, of course, it's against Sacramento, and I want him to recapture that. 30 point quarter or whatever it was. So uh, he's the one guy that I've, I've crossed off my, my list thus far. Uh, but some of these other guys here, Andre Iguodala, what, what are we going to do with him? Uh, Livingston is questionable. I think he's probably going to play, but as we saw last year, he's, he has a very, a, a more limited role than one would imagine, uh, especially with, with the, the rest of the backcourt healthy. They've got Quinn Cook there, um, no, no Patrick McCaw. He's still uh, he's, uh, not signed, shall we say. But they, I was reading an article today that they've kept 14 spots. They didn't, they didn't add anybody because they're still trying to sign him. But that's not going to affect us on Tuesday. What, what are you looking at from some of these secondary players here? Yeah, so I mean, as far as Iguodala, I don't, I don't really get excited about any of the backcourt or wing backups on Golden State just because they're not highly productive players, even when they do see minutes. You know, Iguodala is not really that productive. Sean Livingston's even less productive. And it's not like they're locked in the big minutes, especially this early in the season either. So I'm not really too excited about them. I do want to go back to the Clay Thompson point, though, because I'm actually very interested in him because – So obviously we expect Golden State to score a lot of points. Oklahoma City's defense without Andre Roberson, we saw last year, is absolutely trash. It's going to be the faster-paced game out of the two. And even if you are concerned about blowouts, which is a whole separate tangent that I'm not going to go on, the points have to come from somewhere here. And But one thing that is always interesting about Thompson is if Steve Kerr utilizes rotations in the same way that he did last season, Thompson was more blowout-proof than – most of the guys on Golden State because he subs in at the start of the second and the fourth quarter and that allows him to stay to be on the floor in the fourth quarter kind of regardless of score and whereas you know you you have Steph Curry who could just not be brought in ever in the fourth quarter Thompson's already out there so his minutes are a little bit more secure you saw the same thing last year with Kevin Durant he was always he would sub out first Steph Curry would play most or all of the first and then Durant would come back in with the the second unit to start the second. So Durant and Thompson were the two guys last year that kind of regardless of score, almost always got fourth quarter minutes. Thompson obviously is really inexpensive as well. So I I do like him quite a bit. And then Curry and Durant, you know, obviously are are two of the top plays on the slate just because they really don't even need to play the fourth quarter, most likely to to put up some of the highest draw scores. Yeah, that is, that is interesting. Thompson is 5,900 on DraftKings and he is 6,300 on FanDuel. So, reasonably priced in you know as you you mentally game this out uh like you did if they're projected to score 115 118 points we know curry and durant are going to get theirs draymond doesn't really score very much uh we don't know what's going to happen with jones bell iguodala we know that livingston doesn't score much jarebko looney yeah not going to worry about them so 
I mean, I guess, I, I guess that is, uh, once again, Adam, a very valid point that the points have to come from somebody. It very well could be Clay Thompson. So who knows? That's what makes it fun. So this is where the multi, uh, entry takes place. You can kind of build teams and then build a variation of it. I'll build this team with clay. And then I will build this team as if clay has a bad night using the same core. And then whichever outcome happens, if you did well with your other selections, you will be alive towards the end of the evening. What are you going to do overall? Is this a multi-entry night for you? No, I, I threw some head-to-heads out just to give myself something to do, but I probably won't bother with tournaments just because I hate two-game slates. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I threw out not even a, a lot, but I threw out a few head-to-heads on DraftKings just to give myself something to, to make lineups and, and watch the games. But, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be starting in earnest more on Wednesday. All right. Well, I've been uh, playing in these contests uh, for, like, a quarter and a dime to win a ticket into the DraftKings $1 million contest, 250000 the first. I have 15 tickets. I, I had two really good football weekends where I would just put in one one lineup or one entry in each of these things, and I cleaned up. So now I've got 15 lineups. Out of I don't know what I'm going to do with these. Well, I, I told you before the show, I almost, and I'm glad I, I caught my mistake, I almost max entered the $8 on DraftKings because all day today I thought that these two games were – tonight monday night and that the actual you know full full tip off was on tuesday and so i looked at like 6 30 and i saw that the eight dollar on DraftKings was like 15 percent full i was like what the hell is going on and i was about to just you know throw 150 lineups in and i would have been very pissed off i had to play 150 uh, lineups on this slate with no overlay uh, on tuesday yes yes now i did the same thing in football on DraftKings, and it was the thursday night single game uh, opener and I ended up with like 23 tickets into them. You, you have to monetize the tickets. So even though I spent about 50 bucks and that was a $10 contest, so I had $230 worth of tickets, I only got 80 bucks back. So, I mean, I made a little bit, Yeah. Yep. but it, it's one of those where it's like, oh, it's fun having the tickets until you're trying to make teams. You're like, how many variations of this thing can I do? <laughs> right. Yeah. It, it, it feels good when you win them. It feels good when you're entering and, and not spending any money and then – that's about then you actually you actually have to win yes yes so we'll we'll see how that happens we'll know uh when we do our podcast for thursday we will find out and see what there is and then i'll uh we'll we'll do some drafts later on uh in the season just to spice things up a little bit but because this is the opening night we're focused on these two games so any final thoughts before we get on out of here no uh it should be a pretty fun slate i think for for two games at least all right. Well, don't don't hesitate. Jump on over there to Osmo.com. Again, there's some free stuff uh, in front of the paywall. There's shows seemingly all day. There's all sorts of fun. The Slack chat behind the paywall is a good time. Uh, you get access to all of the contributors. Uh, Osmo pops in there uh, from time to time answering questions, and it's it's been a lot of fun. We we miss, we miss the old side, but you know what? The new side's doing pretty well. So come on. Check us out. You can find Adam on Twitter at ShipMyMoneyDFS. You can find me at EmacDFS. And Osmo is uh, at Osmo.com. It's a weird spelling, but uh, you'll find him on Twitter as well. With that, gamers, good luck.